I've really little been gap. trying to not make fun of Chinese people on stage. And like the last three shows I did, there's just Chinese people there. <laughs> and I can't help myself. They just say something or they look at me in a certain mm-hmm. way. Uh-huh. They're and there. They're, to, yeah. And that's the best part of my set. A hundred percent. Yeah. I don't know. Huge <laughs> uproarious yeah, laughter yeah, yeah. whenever you fucking hold your eyes back real well. Yeah, real. yeah, yeah. Nick <laughs> took out some uh, tape and taped his eyes back last night. You did it on stage? He had, he yeah. Had, he had a gone. Oh, I thought you were just doing stage. it. No, no, I'm trying all new sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. I'm you really trying to like redefine what stand-up <laughs> yeah. can be. A kimono and one of those fucking conical <laughs> patty, uh, yeah, rice right. patty hats. <laughs> Filled the entire club with incense. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled like jasmine eucalyptus 30 minutes before my set. Everyone's like, what is this? And then I you come out and then, so, like quickly fanning myself. Bang, so, bang, yeah. bang, bang. Nobody so, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being a man. <laughs> Why um, nobody <laughs> fuck me? And I did my whole. Why nobody? <laughs> why nobody fuck me? The, the Chinese <laughs> incel. <laughs> Just me dressed as a geisha. <laughs> there is a sentence that I hear sometimes about comedy that pisses me off rather bigly. Comedy is there to punch up and never punch down. First of all, this is not true. Comedy is about one thing and precisely only one thing all of the time, and that's being funny. But also, let's be honest, the kind of people who say this shit are the ones who will find a joke about white trailer park trash hilarious. But then when there is one about a black millionaire CEO with unbelievable amounts of power, oh no no, that's a ve- that's very punching down. Because they don't believe in that statement either, they just want a thought-stopping cliché to justify their own preferred social hierarchy with. But comedy is a place of anarchy. Comedy does not like Hierarchy. Comedy is a free-for-all where everything and everyone can be questioned and ridiculed in the most unacceptable ways possible. It's been this way since basically the dawn of human civilization. Maybe even before that. Who knows what kind of jokes the cavemen were telling. And it's also why tyrants really love to censor comedy big time. And if they're advanced tyrants who are very good at tyrants, They love to only allow comedy that supports them. You know, punching down. Speaking out against tyranny, by the way, also not the purpose of comedy. It's just something that comedy does. At the same time, somebody goes on stage, their whole set is black people be stealing. (laughs) Ha ha. I'm probably not gonna laugh. Because I don't think that's funny. And one of the main reasons why I think it's not funny is because it's hitting a target that is, in my personal estimation, not an acceptable target. Mainly though, it's just not relatable because I don't hold these beliefs. Now, a racist might find those things very funny because he thinks that's relatable. They are in line with his preconceived notions about the world. He's gonna sit there and laugh and think, yeah. Black people do be stealing all the time. Pointing out something that is relatable to the audience is one of the many very basic forms of comedy. It's why the line, what is the deal with airplane food, works so well. But if I don't like racist jokes, as I have just said, I don't find them funny. Why do I love racist jokes and think they're the funniest shit in the world? Because I really fucking love completely inappropriate comedy, the the dark stuff, the shit that's genuinely offensive, and a lot of that is racist, because racism is very offensive to me. Or to put it in uh, simple terms, why am I such a big fan of Nick Mullen and the Cumboys. Yeah, people love their their, their, their heritage temperature. So yeah. so <laughs> like if you ever if you ever trying there's... to if you ever trying to like impress like a, a, a Persian woman, just blow sand in her eyes. Okay, that's not really a temperature. That's not a temperature. It's a, yeah, it's a climate. <laughs> oh, it's a dusty climate. And that sounds pretty um uncomfortable. Look, look all I can tell you is this: it works. <laughs> I don't know the science behind it, but I can tell you, it fucking works. You've tried uh-huh. this? I've tried numerous times. Right. Anytime I meet a uh, 
a, a Persian woman mm-hmm. a stand right in the eyes, and right. then she's like, and "I she me you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, she's she's speaking Arabic. <laughs> the language of Iran. <laughs> Why is this so funny to me? Clearly it must be because I'm a racist misogynist, as this is a joke that targets POC women. But it's not, though, is the thing. It... That's not what it's doing. The target of this joke, if you really want to pin down one, is none other than Nick Mullen. The joke here is not Mexican women be Persian. The joke here is look at this fucking idiot who has these weird beliefs where he cannot tell apart Mexican people and people from Iran. Who, when he hears Spanish, thinks it's Arabic. Who thinks women like it from the Middle East if you throw sand in their eyes. And that's pretty much the entire concept of Nick Mullen as a comedian. The other half is absurdism, which, you know, it sort of follows from this to a very large extent because the character is inherently absurd. And it also, when it gets into the really insane territory, very racialized because that's one of the main topics that he covers. Yeah, towns with like they got a population of 500, the town's bankrupt and they're like, "Well, I guess we'll let one man own the entire town." You can sim city that shit. Yeah. That's awesome. Why would you yeah, get Do a, they all have to suck your dick? Yeah, I'm going to get a little town in Georgia, rename it Slavery Rocks. <laughs> no. And then just uh, drive around in my rusted out Coupe de Ville with the top sawed off. Sawed off in a yeah. white in a white yeah. seersucker. How you doing, boys? <laughs> Hot out today, isn't it, Miss <laughs> Miss Claudia? Oh. There yes, goes see? Ca- Colonel Mullen. See, yeah. see Colonel Mullen. Man. I'm gonna say something, man. I'm gonna say something to him. No, I don't. That faggot ass white boy on the whole damn town. We can't, we can't stop him, man. <laughs> That faggot, that the little, podcast factory is that, too powerful. That little faggot ass white boy on every building in this goddamn town. <laughs> when podcast came yeah. to this town, stay cool out there, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> There's way more insane bits than this on the Come Town podcast. Way more racist ones too. And I think that's not only fine, I think that's very good. One of the very important roles that comedy fulfills as an art form in society is that it talks about things that you're not allowed to talk about in ways that you are not allowed to talk about them. It is a space for conversations that are very far outside the Overton window and they don't have to make sense, they don't have to come to any good conclusions, just having an idea in a room and then just letting it stay. And race, especially in America, happens to be a very important subject in the cultural zeitgeist. A lot more people these days and for the past couple years have been waking up to the notion that, hang on, maybe systemically discriminating against the descendants of a kidnapped and enslaved population and having like a whole caste of revered psychopath warrior mercenaries be able to like legally murder them in public. Maybe that whole thing is not, you know, strictly speaking good. It's something that we need to talk about. And if you want to have a genuine conversation about something, comedians need to be able to make horrific jokes about it. And yes, actual real racist comedians who do comedy for actual real racists could be doing the exact same jokes word for word and actually mean minorities as the target. Not only could that happen, it actually legitimately does happen. But if you think Nick Mullen is doing this because he's using those same words, it, not only are you displaying a fundamental lack of understanding of how comedy works, but just a fundamental lack of understanding of how human interaction in general works. And you know, uh, not everyone is on the up and up about the subtle nuances of human interaction. Could be you have autism. But if you are a journalist who is just recounting these jokes, writing them down in a neutral tone of voice as though they were a factual statement, 
You are a tattletale who is actively decontextualizing a sentence in order to go tell on somebody by misrepresenting what they said in a way that is very clearly and very explicitly not what they meant. And people say this kind of shit about Nick Mullen all the time, and they are either socially inept, which is fine, you can be socially inept, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, or and this is probably the, 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 the more, more common scenario, is that they're dishonest liars. But if you want an example that isn't necessarily dealing with like racial themes, we can talk about another hit that falls into the same vein. Uh, one that you may well have heard of if you listen to comedy at all, that's Louis C.K.'s Gisanthropus bit. This is a bit, I think it came out in a special from the early 2010s, and I cannot put it up here in the video, of course, because a digital rights management company that Louis CK will probably have never heard of, will have monetized the entire video for like a one minute clip, faster than I can say fair use for the purposes of commentary and education. So the bit is, Louis CK, like other parents, helps out in the kindergarten, supervising kids while they have outside playtime. And this kid, he gives him the codename Gisanthropus, is bullying his daughter. So he does what any rational parent would do and uh, charges at this five-year-old boy, grabs him by the shoulders, lifts him in the air, and begins hurling abuse at him. And that is the joke. The joke is not, ha ha, I traumatized a child, but ha ha, I am a piece of shit. And if you actually listen to the special, this will be very clear to you. But the way that I just told it, without the context of this video, it's a little bit ambiguous. I could, if I were very dishonest, point out that throughout telling the joke, Louis C.K. repeatedly reiterates that this is something that actually really happened in the real world, and which he really did. Which is, of course, evidence that Louis C.K., father of two, is very much an advocate for fully grown men to physically assault five-year-old boys. You realize how insane that sounds, right? That's an insane statement to me. The fact that Louis insists that this really happened is evidence that it really 100% did not happen. It's a technique told to augment the quality of the joke. It makes it funnier. Because that way, he is taking away the suspension of disbelief to make himself seem like more of an asshole. It's part of the setup of the joke, and that's a very important thing to know because context matters. And the context here is Louis C.K. is on stage and telling a joke, and that makes whatever he says sacred and untouchable. The comedy stage is a holy place of free speech. You could admit to an actual crime on stage, and it wouldn't even be counted as circumstantial evidence in a court of law, because you have the plausible deniability of being able to say, I was on a comedy stage. <laughs> and guess what, bitch? You dragged your feet on it. I have it now. If you get it, you're copying me. That's copying. how the rules of copying work. Your paycheck's cut off for this one. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm, on strike. I'm calling your fucking credit card company and disputing <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. No, I'm um, disputing it on his behalf. No, he copied me. Do not hang up on me again. I will kill you. I will come to that office with an AR-15, a fully, full clip, a fully automatic AR-15 on November 18th next year at 5.50 p.m. This is a specific direct threat over international, over state lines. This is a 100% real, not satire threat to kill kill you <laughs> if you hang up on me <laughs> No way, shape, or form could it be interpreted as parody or joke. God damn, them just playing the audio at your trial would be so awesome. I was kidding. Yeah. Again, I would like to reiterate, this is not a joke. In the event that they play this at the trial, and I claim I was kidding. Tell the fucking judge. Look at my defense attorney's face right now. You see how fucking pissed he is? It's because he knows this is real. <laughs> Motherfucker, do not let him get that Vitamix. You cancel shipment now. He will not copy me. Stan Help has a whole bit about how he used his mother's identity after she died to buy dumb shit online using her credit cards. But it's packaged as a joke, so this serious felony is something that 
you'd need very direct proof and evidence for as the police in order to do anything about it. And that is good, that is excellent. That is an important marker of a healthy society where people can discuss things freely. If you do not have this, you essentially do not have any sort of freedom or right to self-determination. But there are of course spaces in comedy today where it is not possible to say these things. Yes, of course I am talking about big comedy, you know, Saturday Night Live, the, the, the late night jimmies, the, all the comedians just d big names drenched in complete vapidity. Look, I'm, I'm not saying that you have to have racism in your set to be funny. I don't think that at all. I love Jim Gaffigan. He's so clean, he opened for the Pope. But I am saying that most A-list comedy is sanitized corporate bullshit that is in no way thought-provoking or, and you know, this is the mortal sin of comedy, really the only sin of comedy uh, in any way funny. The only people who watch that shit are aging gen ex-liberal to think voting for Joe Biden makes them working-class revolutionaries. There was a phase in time where things were not like this, where, uh, you know, very, very dark and dirty big-name comedy existed under big houses with big money. It still does sometimes today. It's sort of like Cumtown. It seems like everyone on Drew Carey show is friends and having fun. Definitely a similar caliber. Absolutely. Of, of, of joke writing. Of writing, yeah. yeah. Well, I think so. As much thought went into yeah. that show as goes I don't goes know. Like they would have, I think they would have episodes that dealt have better with like, jokes, you know, being but... like a middle class American and like we're like, what if a retard was gay? <laughs> Which, by the way, <laughs> you said it as a joke, but it's just hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Can I fuck your dick? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Man, yeah. they need to let us have Jesus Mad TV. Christ. Just give us the show. <laughs> to get on get on Twitter. We gotta chill with Hashtag all this fire shit. everyone on Mad TV and hire the cum boys. But here's the thing though, right? Young people, especially young comedians, they're not watching Saturday Night Live. Young comedians are listening to Cum Town. They're watching the Eric Andre show. They're not stupid. They understand that the overwhelming majority of what runs on television is comedy in the same way that North Korea is a democratic people's republic. The Cowboys, bless them, and many of the comedians who do similar things to what they do are doing well, and they are shaping a whole new generation of comics. The way comedians talk about how Richard Pryor and Bill Hicks were big influences on them when they were coming up. In like 20 years, comedians that are very young now are gonna lament that Nick Mullen, who was such a big influence on them, shot himself in the head as an April Fool's joke after his 40th birthday. I genuinely, unironically think that Nick Mullen is one of the most influential comedians of our time. And yes, I am very aware that the title says most influential, but this is YouTube. Welcome to the game. I got fucking rent to pay. How would one even measure what is objectively most influential? What did you think this was going to be? He's certainly the most influential to me personally, so it's not even wrong. And just to point this out, because I feel like it needs to be said, uh, Stavros Halkias and Adam Friedland, I think both are very good comedians. I enjoy, uh, you know, their contribution to the podcast and also uh, to, like, their independent sets that they have very much. I just unironically also think that Nick Mullen is a comedy genius of some description in his own particular way, and the main contribution that those two are going to have to comedy as a whole is to make him so much better than he already is. Because you, you need your people, you need people to play off of, and they have specialized in this. And that, I think, is a pretty fucking good legacy. Thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. So supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, uh, buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. First time I did it from this angle, I was completely out of frame. I am a genius who has been doing this job for several years now. And in that spirit, go watch some comedy. It, you don't even, don't even have to watch Countdown if that's not your thing. You know, watch something that's clean if that's the comedy you prefer. It's about being funny. And see you around, cunts.